So this is uh, the live session where we will cover the week nine problems. So there will be one more live session um, next week where we will go through the week 10 problems. I will also set some week 11 problems, but of course, because um, the end of term occurs in two weeks time, there won't be a live session that will go with that. So I will just issue some short answers to go with those. Uh, you will probably notice the week nine and week 10 problems um, will cover similar material to what is in uh, example sheet five. And I use the example of the diamond light source quite extensively um, in, my, uh, in my examples, in the notes and in the example sheet. Um, it's a very useful light source uh, to refer to because, it, because it's a good example of how synchrotron radiation is used in practice. Um, let me just bring up the chat window there in case there's any chat. So as usual, please ask questions in the chat window. Um, you can ask anonymously or not. Uh, they won't be displayed on the screen, of course. And um, we are going through this week, uh, the week nine problems. So let's go through them as we normally do in order. There are four questions this week and they're meant to illustrate uh, the concepts of waveguides. Um, and the last question talks about uh, the microwave oven cavity. Uh, so you should be comfortable with the idea of the cavity after last week. And in uh, um, similar to last week, I'm gradually moving over to doing calculation sheets using uh, Mathematica in this case. And I encourage you to use um, your own calculation sheets, either Python or Mathematica or something similar uh, as a way of doing convenient calculations. So let's start with question one. So question one says, a given waveguide is chosen with dimensions 50 millimeters by 15 millimeters. Calculate the cutoff frequency for the waveguide and then calculate the cutoff frequencies of the next three modes of the waveguide and sketch the electric field in these four modes. So we start um, with uh, defining some useful units. So I'm defining here some variables. A gram is 10 to the minus three, a centimeter is 10 to the minus two. So I can use those variables as a shorthand for doing multiplication by these numbers. It just makes the calculations easier to read. And below, I I'm using the same uh, constants that I've used in previous weeks. And most of these you will recognize from the constants and units sheet. So I just use these as a sort of catch-all area uh, in, in case I want to use any of them. And you will notice that the one we will be using here, of course, is the speed of light. Now, um, now where did we go? We, we went last week. Oh, this is the cavity mode sheet. So I should be using this one up here. I'm sorry. So. I'm going to be looking at the waveguide fields. And this is one particular bit where I've updated the um, I've updated the um, uh, the notes to make clearer the scaling between the horizontal and vertical fields. And um, uh, there is actually a small scaling difference here between EX and EY, which is which is correct in the notes, but not actually quite correct here. Um, because these two should be scaled with respect to each other, um, but it doesn't really change how the visualization looks. So I, I will correct this after this uh, session. Now, what I've done apart from that is I've, I've merely written down for the three electric fields, I've written down the formulae exactly as they're given in the notes. And the important thing here is that um, in, for each particular direction of field, the EX field can point into and out of the walls which lie at particular values of X, but must fall to zero on the boundaries in the Y direction. This is why there has to be a cosine for this first term and a sine for the second term. And of course, this means that for the electric field in the Y direction, I have to reverse that sine and that cos. Now, you can see here that in the sine terms, the electric field will fall to zero whenever n pi y over b um, um, is either uh, falls to, is either zero or pi. Okay, so that means that the the mode number n defines how many half wavelengths there are in the y direction, and that number, in order to have a finite value for the field, must be um, one or more. In contrast, 
in the m in the cosine term m can be zero because i can have a constant electric field as a function of distance x that then also varies in y okay so it's constant in x but varies in y so this is similar to our cavity case so you can see here that my x field has this form my y field has this form and superimposed on top is the variation because of the propagation and phase change of those uh, those uh, plane waves that propagate down the waveguide. So obviously there's a time variance, which is omega t, and there is a phase variance, which is given by the wave number kz in the longitudinal direction down the aperture of the waveguide. Now, when I describe a TE mode, I have by definition defined that ez, the electric field along the waveguide, is zero. And writing down the fields in this way, I can relate the magnetic fields to the electric fields by means of this transformation. Here, I'm just basically taking the curl of, uh, of the electric field is, uh, is equal to the time variation of the magnetic field. So I can derive the magnetic fields directly from the electric fields, and this is what they look like. Now, um, in order to visualize these fields, I merely plot them out. So let's do that for our first question, which is question one. And you can see I, I have defined the shorter side A as being 15 millimeters and the longer side B as being 50 millimeters. I've defined for convenience that the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight rather than its more accurate value 2.998. And that's just so we can see the frequencies um, in a truncated form. The basic, um, the basic features of our, of our field descriptions are not really changed by that small variation in the, in the velocity of light that we're considering here. And our convention is, is that the lowest order mode, the one with the lowest frequency, the lowest cutoff frequency, is given when m equals zero, which is the value that goes with a, the shorter side, and n equals one, which is the value that goes with b, which is the longer side. So I, I, I type out the formulae that we have from the notes, which is the cutoff frequency is given by this formula, the square root of m squared of a squared plus n squared of a b squared. And that's my cutoff frequency. But the frequency that I am trying to send down the waveguide, I've just picked a given frequency of five gigahertz. And below we will see what is the cutoff frequency. So you can see here, I have calculated the cutoff frequency and the frequency that I'm trying to propagate down the waveguide. So I, I type out here f divided by 10 to the nine. So that's this five over here. That's our, that's, our, that's our driving frequency. That's our source frequency. The cutoff frequency is in this case is three gigahertz. And you can see here that because m equals zero, it's basically given by the value of n. So I can check to see if I'm above cutoff or below cutoff. And of course, five is bigger than three, so I'm above cutoff. And that means that five gigahertz radiation can propagate along the waveguide. So let's make that number two and just check that in fact, it is below cutoff. Yes, it is below cutoff. So I go back to five gigahertz. And you can see here that when I plot out the fields, I plot out here, I'm just doing a vector plot. So for each value of x and y, see for each value of x and y in the waveguide, I am plotting out a vector which has magnitude ex in the x direction and ey in the y direction. So of course, because I am uh, selecting the zero one mode, the electric field only points in the x direction. So this is x horizontally here, of course, and you can see that the x direction um, is the short direction from zero to 15 millimeters and the y direction is from zero to 50 millimeters or five centimeters on this axis. So you can see that the electric field points across the short side of the waveguide and it falls, uh, it rises and falls from zero to five centimeters in a half sine wave shape. So it's strongest in the middle and falls to zero at either boundary as it needs to. And so if I were to draw that, it would be a half sine wave um, with a maximum in the middle at 2.5 centimeters. Now, more than that, I can calculate two other numbers. I can calculate the free space wavelength, which is lambda, and that's two pi divided by k, where k is the free space wave number. 
And I can also calculate the wavelength along the waveguide. This is lambda z. And lambda z is 2 pi divided by the longitudinal wave vector, kz. So if I calculate what those numbers are, we can see that the free space wavelength that goes with 5 gigahertz, the free space wavelength, is 6 centimeters. Whereas the wavelength of that wave within the waveguide, due to the interference caused by the reflection of the waves off the waveguide walls, that wavelength is longer. It is 7.5 centimeters. So we see that the wavelength of the radiation for this frequency, the wavelength of the radiation, is longer than the free space wavelength. So let's try adjusting that frequency. So the nice thing about this calculation, by doing it on a computer, we can see very quickly how the, uh, the wavelengths um, and, um, and other features of the electric field vary as a function of our driving frequency. So here I've increased the driving frequency to 10 gigahertz. So we're now well above cutoff. And as you can see, the longitudinal wavelength falls to be closer to the free space wavelength. So very large frequencies, I now, now set my frequency to be 20 gigahertz. You can see it that at 20 gigahertz, the free space, the free space wavelength becomes very comparable to this wavelength in the longitudinal direction. But the shape of that radiation, where it's a maximum and where it's a minimum, does not change. So I wondered to myself, what has changed as I increase this driving frequency? Well, this driving frequency is, is, we can imagine it to be the frequency which is fed into the waveguide. And I can select that by changing the frequency of some form of source. It could be a magnetron, it could be a klystron, it could be, uh, could be anything really, right? Um, as I increase that frequency, the, the electric field pattern in this particular mode does not change. But as that frequency rises, eventually, I will start to excite other modes. Other modes can be formed because this driving frequency will start to rise up above the cutoff frequency of different modes. Now, normally, we don't want that to occur. In a well-designed system, I will set the waveguide. I will choose a waveguide aperture to match the frequencies which I expect to be transported down the waveguide. So we would not normally do this. Now, let's look at the other, range, uh, the other uh, end of the scale. Let's try a frequency of 4 gigahertz. And we can see now that this wavelength is now growing. It's now 11 centimeters instead of seven centimeters. And as I, as I reduce the driving frequency, remember all of these frequencies can be transmitted along the waveguide. Um, what's happened here? Yes, that's right. As, as, I've, as I drop the driving frequency, the wavelength of that radiation within the waveguide starts to diverge away from the free space wavelength. Of course, as I drop the frequency, the free space wavelength is increasing, but the wavelength of the wave within the waveguide increases more than that. And as I approach the cutoff frequency, that wavelength now diverges. It becomes very, very large. Okay, so our cutoff frequency was here was three gigahertz. So if I drop the driving frequency to 3.01 gigahertz, just above the cutoff, the wavelength here is 10 centimeters in free space, but the wavelength in the waveguide is now growing to be over a meter. And again, if I drop very, very close to that, you can see now here that the waveguide, uh, the, the wavelength of the wave within the waveguide is now four meters. So of course it will approach infinity as, uh, as the, um, as the uh, frequency of, that I'm driving through the waveguide falls down to the cutoff frequency. And of course, when I fall below the cutoff frequency, say 2.99 gigahertz, I am now below cutoff and I no longer have a real value for the wavelength. So this becomes an evanescent wave and there is no transmission of power down the waveguide. Okay. So whilst I have the same field pattern, this field pattern, of course, is, is not physically real anymore. Now that's our first, that's our first, um, first mode, but we can now look at other modes. So um, let's have a look. We'll look down. Um, that's a zero one mode. Oh yes, we want to plot what they look like. Okay, so the frequency, let's calculate the zero one mode uh, for the same aperture. So I calculate that. And you can see our free space wavelength is seven 
uh, and our waveguide wavelength is 7.5 centimeters. And let's visualize that. So what I'm calculating here is I've created a plot, which is a plot of the electric field in three dimensions now. And I'm just storing that for a moment. And then down here, I'm calculating the magnetic field. You see, I'm creating a field, a plot of the magnetic field. So I'll create that plot. And again, these are both for the same aperture of waveguide and the same mode. And when I plot them out together, you can see this pattern of the fields. Now, the important thing here is notice that the wavelengths along the Z direction are the same. And the electric field and the magnetic field are a maximum at the same location in the waveguide for the same time. You can see here I'm plotting at zero time. But notice that if you look closely, the electric field is pointing up in this piece and down in this piece and then up in this piece and down in this piece and so on. But the magnetic field is pointing to the left where the electric field is pointing up. And then when the electric field is pointing down, the magnetic field is pointing to the right. So again, as we have seen many times before, the electric field and the magnetic field are pointing perpendicular to each other. And clearly you can see that the wavelength of the wave in the waveguide here is quite obviously the distance between this first upward pointing electric field and the second upward pointing electric field. And you can see by eye, it falls at 7.5 centimeters, which is exactly as we calculated it. That's hardly surprising. Now let's look at the next mode. So we'll calculate the next mode, which is the zero two mode for the same aperture of waveguide. And I'm going to plot what it looks like. And you can see here that our cutoff frequency is six gigahertz. Our free space wavelength is now half what it was before. It's three centimeters. Wonder why it's taking a little time to calculate. There it is. And you can see that the electric field now has a different form. Okay, so if I'll just move it around, if I can rotate it. I've got quite a few electric field lines. So you can see as I spin it around, you can see that in the zero two mode, in the zero two mode, the electric field, because it's a zero mode for our first index, that means it does not vary in the, uh, along the y-axis, doesn't, does not vary in A, but it does vary, sorry, it does not vary in the, along the x-axis, but it does vary along the y-axis, it points up on the left-hand end of B and it points down in this right-hand end and it's zero in the middle. So that's what our electric field looks like in the TE02 mode. Now, of course, you can see that the magnetic field will point at right angles to, to, uh, to, to the electric field in all these cases. And you can see that it, as we saw before, it will circulate, it'll point to the left, right, um, at each of the planes where the electric field is a maximum in strength. And it will curl around and point, it will curl around and point uh, backwards in, uh, in, in the region in between. Okay, so the zero three mode, no surprises for guessing that the zero three mode um, has three maxima in it. Its cutoff frequency is nine gigahertz. And we just wait for a little while while it uh, plots out. <laughs> there we go. It plots out the, um, uh, the electric field lines. So there are a number of different ways you can plot these field lines. Um, I'm just choosing a convenient one, which is a vector plot package, which happens to be available in Mathematica. Uh, Python has these as well. Okay, so again, what I'm doing is I'm plotting out uh, little arrows pointing in three dimensional space, and I'm just plotting them out for different values of, uh, of uh, A, B, sorry, X, Y, and Z, and just plotting out their magnitudes and coloring them according to their magnitude. Okay. So that's the, those are the, those are three modes. Now, we should probably also look what happens when we go to the, um, the, the first mode uh, where we have a half sine wave in the other axis. So that's the one zero mode. So the one zero mode, of course, has the electric field rising and falling along the, along the other direction. And there it is. So you can see that now points in the opposite direction. It points uh, along, along the axis B rather than along the axis A. And, uh, but other than that, it's much the same. And its cutoff frequency is 10 gigahertz. So what I've done before in order to be able to plot these electric fields is I have I've have had to set when I calculated each of these cases, 
I had to set the driving frequency to be above the cutoff frequency. So when I actually ran these for the first time, I calculated the cutoff frequency first and then set the driving frequency to be a little way above it. Um, and these wavelengths that I'm calculating here just happen to be the wavelengths that go this, this, wave, this wavelength uh, and this free space wavelength are the ones that happen to go with this particular frequency. Okay, so they're not, they're not the wavelengths for this particular mode. That's not, that's not a correct statement. Right, now, of course, the other thing we want to do, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. The other thing we want to do is we want to plot how they vary with time. Now, this takes a little bit longer to do. I'm going to give you the code so you can sh see how it's done. But what I'm basically doing is rather than plotting just for zero time, I'm plotting for a variety of times. You can see I'm doing a vector plot for a variety of times. And in this particular syntax in Mathematica, I am choosing to vary the time from zero to some particular um, some particular time t. This is how long I want to simulate for. And I've chosen that to be one period, one over f. And I am selecting a certain number of frames, a certain number of times in between zero and t to calculate for. So that's my step size in this table that I'm making. So what I'm doing is I'm calculating 50 times between zero and t equals capital T, where well, capital T is the period time. And I'm just dropping one lower than that so that when I make an animated plot, I will, I will not have two values at zero time. OK, that's, that's what I've done there. So what I need to do now is I just need to bring up, the, um, bring up that plot. So I previously plotted this and saved it. And you can see, hopefully, it will, it will animate. Uh, maybe if I can just, uh, there we go. OK, so this is an animated GIF that I've created. And as you can see, this is the T E01 mode propagating along the waveguide, propping along, propagating along the Z direction. And um, I've selected it to go in that direction because I've chosen a minus sign for my e, uh, omega T minus KZZ. But of course, it's perfectly possible to have a plus KZZ, and that would represent a wave propagating in the opposite direction. So that's the electric field. And of course, there will be a magnetic field that goes with it. I can bring that up. All right. And you can see that the magnetic field points uh, uh, perpendicularly towards the electric field. And in between the places where it's a maximum, it circulates back. OK, so they're actually closed field lines for the magnetic field. That's not perhaps very clear here, but you can see it in the notes uh, where I don't color according to the strength of the magnetic field, you can see that quite clearly the magnetic fields are forming closed loops, which of course they have to do. Okay, so that is question one. So you can see I'm plotting a variety of um, a variety of um, cases which all basically illustrate the same ideas. So I'll now go down to the next question, which is a sort of classic question. So this is our microwave oven. So this is a 2.45 gigahertz magnetron, which is the predominant frequency of magnetrons used in microwave ovens. And 73 by 33 millimeter waveguide is a sort of standard S-band waveguide. And you may notice when you see these waveguides in catalogs that there is a small variation in the, um, in the dimensions of the waveguide. And hopefully you will now recognize that it doesn't really matter exactly how big these are. They only slightly change the cutoff frequencies, but as long as I utilize a driving frequency, which is something like two to three gigahertz, then I only excite the zero one mode. And that way, that means I know exactly which, uh, which way the electric field is pointing. And that's, impor that's important because it means I can get the correct power rating of waveguide so that I know I'm not going to uh, spark it. I, I know that I'm not going to uh, operate the waveguide in such a way, way that the electric field exceeds the breakdown limit um, of the material within the waveguide, which is obviously usually air. OK, so what modes are excited by this magnetron? Well, hopefully you can immediately see that um, 73 by 33 millimeters um, has a cutoff frequency around about 2 gigahertz. So let's calculate that. Okay, so here are my rectangular waveguide cutoff frequencies. So again, I'm just calculating that formally. I'll just calculate those. There we go. 
So um, I've set the speed of light to be three times 10 to the eight, so that these numbers are more clearly displayed. And I've just created a function here that gives me the cutoff frequency for a mode MN and for a aperture AB. So if I select the cutoff frequency for the zero one mode, that is 2.054 gigahertz. And for the zero two mode, you can see it is 4.1 gigahertz and so on for the other modes. And normally what we need to do is we should check um, by looking 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, et cetera, until we're well above the frequency that we're trying to send down the waveguide. And we should also check the modes in the other direction, which are 1, 0, and 2, 0, and probably also check 1, 1. So of course we know that 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, yeah, they will be higher than the 1, 1 mode, and 3, 0 will be, oh, excuse me, <coughs> three zero will be higher than the two zero mode. <coughs> so once we've checked from zero one to zero four and from one zero two zero and so on, we know that the other cutoff frequencies will be higher than these lower frequencies. So you can see that I can explicitly calculate each of these cutoff frequencies and I can see by eye that if I select a 2.5 gigahertz magnetron frequency, then um, I will. I can only excite the zero one mode. Okay, so that's that's what I'm doing here. So uh, only the zero one mode can support a traveling wave. The other modes cannot, and they will reflect power backwards. So I will only carry power along the waveguide in this zero one mode. There we are. So that's this is only one mode being excited by this magnetron. So now I can calculate what its properties are, and I just use the same formula that I had before. And here it is and I will plot it out explicitly. And you can see here, I put in 33 millimeters is my horizontal dimension and 73 millimeters is my other dimension, the longer dimension. I'm utilizing the zero one mode again. And you can see, I can explicitly calculate what that mode looks like. And it's free space wavelength is 12.2 centimeters. And the wavelength in the waveguide is 22 centimeters. Okay, so those, so that's how I calculate it for question two. Any questions so far? Is that is that reasonably clear, folks? <laughs> Let's just take a break for a minute. Thank you very much. Okay. Right now, on to something a little bit more difficult. So you can see here that we've been assuming that the waveguide is filled with air, which means that we're assuming that the dielectric constant. Um, of the of the material within the waveguide is uh, one. Okay, the relative permittivity, the uh, the same thing as the dielectric constant, the relative permittivity is one. What happens when things are different? So I've just chosen a a weird and wonderful uh, situation for question three to sort of um, 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 illustrate that. Now before I do that, let's calculate the uh, S-band power limit for our magnetron and for this waveguide. Now this is done in the notes, but I thought I'd explicitly calculate what they, what they look like. So again, I do the same calculation I did before. This is the same thing. And I'm just following through the calculation for the breakdown limit from the notes, where I've calculated the breakdown field. We're given that the breakdown field is three times 10 to the six volts per meter. And I explicitly calculate what the power limit is. And you can see here that I've calculated the power limit, which is Kz over omega mu naught. And the power limit is proportional to the field squared. This is our breakdown field squared. And it's proportional to AB over four. And this power limit is, uh, this is, this is for the zero one mode only. And that power limit when expressed in megawatts is about 7.8 megawatts. So notice what, what changes if I change the, the size of the waveguide. So this is just to show you once more that it's the longer dimension that determines things. The longer dimension determines the cutoff frequency. So if I turn down the value of A, let's make A 10 millimeters instead of 33 millimeters, I have the same cutoff frequency, 2.05 gigahertz, and I have the same free space wavelength, and I have the same wavelength inside the waveguide exactly the same. But what has changed is the power limit. 
because I've made the size of the aperture smaller, I have less space to have that wave, that pointing vector S. So by cutting the aperture down by about a factor of three, we can see that the power limit of the waveguide has also fallen by about a factor of three. So that's the reason why we set this aperture to be as big as we can, while still allowing us to have a reasonable latitude in what frequencies our particular type of waveguide can transmit. So we could set a larger aperture. We couldn't set it to be, say, 70 millimeters. And then, of course, our power limit would be bigger. It would be 16 megawatts. The problem with this is, is that the um, is that when we set it, if we set A to be near to B, we are quite close to allowing a another mode, the, the one zero mode to propagate as well as a zero one mode. And normally we don't want that. We don't want to have some kind of weird degeneracy where we're having fields excited in directions we're not sure about. So we set it to be a smaller value so that we know exactly what's happening with our field. So let's look at question three now. Here we have, um, oh yeah, so the, yeah, sorry. The other thing I did is I did, I did the same calculation for the two cases in the notes so you can see explicitly how they're done. So I've got an eight by 16 millimeter waveguide, which was in the lecture notes, and that had a power limit of 145 kilowatts. And then I had a 34 by 72 millimeter waveguide. Um, and I here I set the cutoff, uh, sorry, I set the, the, um, the breakdown field to be smaller. Um, so in the notes, I think I set it to be uh, 1.5 um, million volts per meter rather than three, which is what I set above. And that's what reduces the power limit by about a factor of uh, four or so. Okay, so that's, so that's the explicit calculation in the notes. So you can see how it's done. And again, again, we move on to question three. And in question three, we have a plastic filled waveguide. So because it's plastic filled with a dielectric constant of five, that means epsilon r, our relative permittivity is five. And because the relative permittivity is, uh, is, is not one, that means that the velocity of light through the dielectric falls. So rather than being 310 to the eight, I need to, I need to divide it, divide that number by the square root of the permittivity, that's our refractive index. So now the speed of light in the waveguide is now 1.3 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, so I can still use the same formula I had before, but I can, um, I can, uh, I, I can um, take account of the fact that the speed of light is different. So this, the value C here have fallen. Now, the other thing we see here is it, it's a very wide, narrow waveguide. It's 120 millimeters wide and only eight millimeters tall. So we can see that obviously the zero one mode is going to have a much lower cutoff frequency than the one zero mode, but let's calculate them explicitly. The zero one mode has a cutoff frequency of 0.56 gigahertz. The zero two mode is 1.1 gigahertz and so on up to the zero four mode at two gigahertz. Okay. And the one zero mode has a much higher cutoff frequency now, which is around eight gigahertz. So you can see this waveguide um, will support only the zero one mode up to a very, very large range of frequencies. And of course, the ones one mode is in this case not far away from the one zero mode um, because um, of that um, uh, difference between the KY and the KZ wave numbers. And um, so let's calculate the maximum power that can be carried by the waveguide. So now my breakdown field is a kilovolt per millimeter. So let's calculate. Here's our breakdown field. And uh, here we are, breakdown field. So it's so this is using the same equation from the notes we had before. It's 1,000 um, 1, uh, volts per millimeter is, one, is uh, 10 to 6 volts per meter. And you can see here that I need to take account of some things which have changed. Because it's a dielectric filled waveguide, the KZ value is modified by the fact that it's a dielectric. Also, the A and B values are different, of course, because the power limit is reduced because the, the narrow side of the waveguide is eight millimeters and it could be larger. So I could increase the power limit by increasing A. But again, by calculating that, uh, that using that formula, I have to take account of all these values and the power limit is about one megawatt. So that's the answer to that question. All right, um, I think we're rolling along 
reasonably uh, smoothly. I'm just going to take another pause in case anyone has any questions. And while I do that, I'll just, for some reason, this mouse is playing up. So I'll just turn it back on again while I wait for questions. Oh, that's better, it's back to normal again. All right, um, I'll move on. So we just have one more question to go through and this is our microwave oven cavity. So I had, uh, I asked you to read through section 6.1.3 and obviously you will notice that, um, that um, really this is a question about cavities. So let me just bring the notes up for this, for this section. What we're talking about is we're talking about a microwave oven which um, has some volume. Um, I don't know why I need to have that highlighted. There we go. Okay, so it has some volume. So that volume is going to be something like 30 by 30 by 20 centimeters in a typical microwave oven. And we saw from our, from our mode calculations in the previous questions that in a cavity of that size, if I have a driving frequency of 2.45 gigahertz, which as we said, was our, was our standard, magnetron frequency, I can excite a, uh, sorry, uh, that's way higher than um, the lowest mode frequencies of the cavity. So the, I, by, by, um, by driving uh, power into this cavity uh, at a different frequency of these modes, I'm going to excite a number of those modes with different efficiencies. And I can make a rough approximation that the electric field is uniform within the cavity volume. Now that's not really true. And you'll notice this is why there's a turntable inside a microwave oven, because there are peaks and troughs in the electric field within the microwave oven cavity. And by moving the thing being cooked within that cavity, we uh, expose different parts of the food to different hotspots of electric field within the cavity volume. Another thing to notice is that um, because there is a material which is absorbing within the cavity, this could be like a chicken or a cup of coffee or something else, right? any, any food we're trying to heat, the Q value of the radiation in the cavity will be lower because of the absorption by the material. And that in itself changes how the modes are excited. Now, before we talk about that, let's calculate what the Q of the cavity is when the cavity is empty. How do I calculate that? Well, my approximation is the following. If I assume that there is a uniform electric field oscillating within the cavity, remember it's oscillating in strength with a frequency equal to the driving frequency, which is the magnetron frequency in this case, 2.45 gigahertz. As I, am, as I have that electric field rising and falling in the cavity, I recognize that there are electromagnetic waves propagating and bouncing off the cavity walls. Now, these cavity walls are, of course, made of a reasonably good conductor. That's, that's what a, a cavity is. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a, a volume enclosed by conducting walls that reflect the electromagnetic radiation. We recognize that there is a finite, um, finite uh, penetration depth, a skin depth, for the radiation into the conducting walls. So you can see that, that, that skin depth, um, is, uh, the th its thickness, is proportional to one divided by the square root of the driving frequency. So as the frequency rises, the skin depth falls. So at low frequencies, the skin depth is large and we lose quite a lot of power into the walls. When the frequency is high, the skin depth falls and we lose less power into the cavity walls. And we can approximate the amount of power by saying that if the an energy extends into the walls of the cavity by some distance delta, then each oscillation cycle, I'm losing a quantity of that energy, which is equal to the proportion of energy within the surface, within the walls, compared to what's in the volume. And we're assuming that that total, surf, that total volume within the walls is small in comparison to the cavity volume. So the way to calculate the amount of energy loss per cycle is to calculate the volume of material in the walls, which, um, which, are, the, which are the surface thickness, the skin depth delta times the surface area of the walls and divide that by the cavity volume V. So that's how I calculate the amount of energy lost in the walls. So let's calculate that. So what I do is I, 
I give myself some particular dimensions for my microwave oven cavity. So I'm assuming that it's uh, 30 centimeters wide, 30 centimeters deep and 20 centimeters tall. So the volume of the cavity is ABD. And in this case, it is 0 0.018 cubic meters. The volume of material in the walls into which the electromagnetic radiation penetrates is equal to the area of each wall times two and then sum together. And then we need to multiply that by the skin depth. And in fact, I have, I have not actually multiplied it by the skin. Oh no, I have multipl I multiplied the skin depth below. So the surface area of the walls is 0.4 square meters. Okay. So let's calculate the skin depth. So my skin depth, the my driving frequency is 2.45 gigahertz. I've selected here just for a bit of variety because we normally choose copper, don't we? Uh, I'm just choosing, um, this is stainless steel, which has a smaller conductivity. I think it's about six times smaller than the conductivity of copper. So that, that's how I selected it. I just looked, looked inside my microwave oven this morning and it looked like it was shiny steel. So I'll, I'll select it to be stainless steel because most shiny steels in the kitchen are made of stainless steel. And I typed stainless steel, into con uh, stainless steel conductivity into Google uh, and looked up what the value was. Now, to calculate the Q value of the cavity, uh, of course, I need to know, uh, 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 I also need to know what the period of the cavity is. So you can see the period is one over the frequency. So the period of oscillations of the electromagnetic field in the cavity is 0.4 nanoseconds. And the skin depth is just two divided by mu naught sigma omega, where omega here is two pi f. And I've assumed that the permeability is equal to one, which is a reasonable assumption. So uh, the skin depth is three micrometers. So if I calculate the proportion of energy which is lost in the cavity walls uh, in each oscillation cycle, we can see it is a very, very small number. So the Q value, which is one over that, which is V divided by S cav D is about 13,000. So I think in the notes it's given as 60,000 and that's because copper has a higher conductivity than steel. So the Q value is about 13,000. So that means that the amount of time it takes for the radiation to die away in the cavity. So this is our question. If the electrical power to the oven is turned off at the plug socket, how long does it take for the trapped radiation in the cavity to die away? So I press stop on the microwave oven or I unplug it. And um, the decay time is equal to the period times the Q value. That's our order of magnitude. And we can see it's about 5,000 nanoseconds or equivalently about five microseconds. So that's the same kind of process as if we were to simply open the door of the microwave oven. If we, as we open the door of the microwave oven, the interlock on the door activates and it cuts off the electrical power that's driving power into the, into the cavity. And it takes less than, a, it takes much less than a, than a second, in fact, much less than a, mil, uh, much less than a millisecond for the electromagnetic power to die, to, dry, to die away. So really the amount of power that we might be exposed to if we just open the microwave oven is more determined by the speed of the electrical shutoff than it is by the uh, length of time that the radiation will stay trapped inside the cavity. Okay, so that's it for this week's, uh, this week's examples. Um, just a note that next week's examples will go into quite a lot of detail about synchrotron radiation. And I do recommend that everyone comes along and uh, attends that one live uh, because um, it's, it's a key area of our lecture course and one that, that I hope you will all, all enjoy. Okay, so I'll just stop there. Are there any other questions that anybody has before we, we wind up for today? There does not appear to be any questions and I, I hear a few people dialing out. Um, so again, I hope that was all useful for everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. And uh, again, the recording will go online probably uh, later on today. And the weekly work is, is already uh, online and good luck with the work this week. I hope you find it enjoyable. Uh, and there are some videos on the YouTube playlist that I do encourage you strongly to have a look at. Uh, these are the ones about light sources. They will really help your understanding of synchrotron radiation and particularly the examples in uh, example sheet five and uh, the week 10, which, which have some similarities. They're quite important to understand for our course. Okay, 
uh, see you all uh, next week for our final session and, and good luck for the week.